So how can we now model, um, simulate uh, a turbulent jet? So if we start with the Rand's equations, we're going to see, well, this is for 2D. You have here some unknowns that you need to uh, add, uh, that you need to have some additional equations for that you don't have. So you need to have a closure for these. So you need to have some sort of expression for, for these terms. And um, in 3D, that's going to be a little bit more complex because you are having one more component. So you have a whole Reynolds stress tensors. You have six components, one, two, three, four, five, six components. Because it's symmetric, you need six components of this tensor to, to close it. But you don't have any equations, so you need to find the model. And uh, we know that the most commonly used model is that the, the eddy viscosity approach. We are we're using now an expression for, for these Reynolds stress tensors using this expression. So and introducing the eddy viscosity. So one of the things that you know already that, for example, here the, um, uh, the um, normal components, that means u prime square, v prime square, and w prime square, they're essentially dominated by this term. That is here by k. And k is defined as one half u prime square plus v prime square plus w prime square. So that is a turbulent kinetic energy. And it also means that uh, the, the, the turbulence model, essentially the turbulence needs to be homogeneous. That means uh, u prime square needs to be approximately w v prime square and w prime square. And we can see that already from our measurements over here. That's not quite the case. So for v prime and w, they are almost identical. But uh, that one is quite OK. But uh, you see u prime squares over here. This one's already quite twice as large as uh, w and v prime square. So that's going to be already one of the issues. But um, for most of the cases, you might be able to, to live with that. So if you're now going to the k or to one of the most commonly used models, the k epsilon model, which is this one here. So the k epsilon model. Um, essentially, you're defining now the eddy viscosity as k square over epsilon. And now, essentially, all of the turbulence that you saw in that uh, in that jet, the coherent structures and the breakdown and uh, the small scale chaotic structures, they're all essentially stuffed into here the k and the epsilon. So you're having two transport equations that are being solved for that for the k and for the epsilon. But you see there's a lot of other terms uh, that are not really well defined. For example, the production term over here, or the uh, dissipation term. So you have some sort of fudge factors here that you need to adjust. And you can do that for certain ranges of that uh, jet. That means um, if your spreading of the jet is OK for, if you're, you can adjust these parameters now to see whether you are uh, experimental results that you have from validation somewhere, that uh, whether you can reproduce that and you're set up putting your setting up your simulation and uh, you see whether it matches and you see it's well maybe a little bit off, you can play around with these parameters, trying to match it to that experimental data. And the reason for that is that you need to do this matching because depending on the, the jet, whether it is um, uh, for example, a round jet or square jet or some sort of, uh, depending on the inlet, inlet conditions, whether it's a really flat profile or it's a surely fully developed profile, there's going to be slight differences from, from the standard model, let's say. And these can be usually found in the initial creation of turbulence when you're trying to, uh, when you're creating these mushroom cage, these coherent structures. And you see, don't see any coherent structures here because you don't have uh, in general, a transient approach with, uh, with that. You don't need a transient approach with that because you're not resolving the turbulence. All of these coherent structures are essentially the same way uh, in, in, in these uh, k and epsilon, the same way that there are um, um, the, the, the small scale turbulence is going to be described with the, with the same model. And that makes it very difficult to find a model that can describe all of these stages. And that's why when you're comparing your results with, with experiments, often you're getting good agreement in certain ranges of your jet, but not all the ranges of the jet. So sometimes you're fitting it for the, for the initial conditions or sometimes for the further downstream, depending on where it ranges.
but uh, with this Rance model, it's um, relatively difficult to get all of the ranges right. And most importantly, if you are fitting it for one particular experiment, it doesn't say that it works well for, for the next experiment or for the next application. So if you have, for example, uh, calibrated your model now for, for one certain application, for one certain um, laboratory test, it doesn't mean that uh, these parameters are going to be holding up uh, when you're putting that into your combustor, for example, or some, some other application. So, and that is where actually large edit simulations um, come in quite handy. You saw, for example, the simulation for that uh, mixing layer. That was a large edit simulation where you can resolve the large scale turbulence in time and space. And you're getting essentially all of these coherent structures resolved that are approximately the same size of the, the jet or the, the, uh, in the order of magnitude of the jet. But um, you're modeling then only the small scale turbulence once and everything had, has broken down. Unfortunately, you need to pay a heavy price for that because uh, first of all, you need to have a transit approach. That means instead of solving just one single solution, you just need to solve a lot of different time steps. And you need to go into three dimensions because all of the turbulence is going to be three-dimensional, so you cannot use a two-dimensional approach because uh, the, the, uh, each of these vortices that you've seen there, they're going to reorient in space, and so you need to actually capture that. So you need to have a three-dimensional approach with it. So, and that is a di dilemma for the simulation of turbulent flows. Either you then need to use a model like this one that can give you some good results and certain ranges. If that is sufficient for you, then, then you can be happy, then you can use a RANS approach. But in some cases, you need to go to more complex approaches so that you can capture all of the physics that's happening there.